Global warming, bringing the armadillos north. Uh, Chris, do you want to give it one more minute and then start off? That that sounds good. All right, I think we can go ahead and start and people can chuckle in as they as they need to. Welcome everyone to our first in a series of data journalism training. Uh, we're very excited to spend Midwest Newsroom's first, we're calling it a semester, uh, focused on this topic. Um, there will be, I believe we're going to do three of these. This is our first one. Uh, Daniel Wheaton will be leading us uh, primarily, so we're very excited about it. The next one, just to put this on your calendar, uh, it could change, but uh, just as a heads up, we're looking at the end of February and the end of March for the number two and number three uh, parts to this. So February 28th and March 27th, look for emails and Slack messages about that once it's solidified. Um, also, a heads up uh, for reporters, we do have a virtual summit happening February 15th. Uh, where we'll have a wonderful guest speaker, Sasha Pfeiffer from NPR, and a lot of other things, as you know, uh, to kind of kick it off where we can have a uh, conversation among reporters and topics and sources and beats uh, to see where we can cross-pollinate and collaborate more um, on that level. So um, if you haven't gotten an invite for that, please reach out to us and we'll make sure that you see it. Um, let's see here. Uh, so with that, I want to introduce our Midwest Newsroom data journalist, Daniel Wheaton. He is based at Nebraska Public Media. Daniel, take it away. How's it going, everyone? Welcome to Data Journalism 101, the Data Viz episode. So this is kind of an introductory uh, discussion of the hows and whys of data visualization. Uh, I've worked with many of you in the nearly three years that I've been at the Midwest Newsroom, and I imagine that there's been some questions of, why did he decide to do this? Why did he decide to do that? Why is he not making the maps that I'm asking about? Well, this will explain some of those questions. So first, here's the outline. We're kind of going to go through a little bit of history and some big theories. I'll discuss some tools and approaches. We'll uh, go through designing a chart together, and we'll end with something fun. Um, feel free to uh, ask a question, uh, both by unmuting yourself or by just ticking in the chat. I'm happy to kind of be derailed during this it's a discussion. I'm not lecturing at you. We're all, you know, kind of chairs turned in a virtual circle all discussing this. So what I have here is an image of the visual display of quantitative information by Edward Tufte. To some people, this is the Bible of data visualization, particularly within journalism. That's because Tufte's whole thing is about having a high data to ink ratio. So that idea is anything you print with ink, the, he's kind of old, this is a print thing, is meant to be the main point. So anything that's extraneous, anything that is just fun but doesn't get to the point needs to be removed in any kind of data visualization. Even though that there are different schools of thought when it comes to data viz, Tufty is still kind of seen as the er, let's really focus our data visualizations because as we all know, we're distracted, we scroll past things fast, we need to have our data viz be really focused. So even if someone just spends a couple seconds looking at it, that main idea comes across. It's not confused and buried under bad design choices or just confusion. So moving on, uh, I'm going to share some famous data visits from history. Uh, this one is one you may have seen. Um, it's kind of a dude poster. It's the March of Napoleon to Moscow. And it is a really interesting combination of a variety of data visualizations. In a sense, you have a really basic map showing all the way from you know, France to Moscow, and then you have the bars of the troop size. So a large army left France marching to Moscow. And as you can see, not many of them made it all the way. And when they started turning the other way, 
that bar turns to that black and it gets smaller and smaller. And it kind of shows the failure of Napoleon in 1812 and 1813. This is a really interesting way of combining multiple ideas. And to some people, this is kind of the first example of modern data visualization in which it took a number of things, how the actual invasion went, how it failed and combined it to tell a story somewhat concisely of the time. And this was printed by um, Charles Menard in a magazine about 50 years after Napoleon attempted the attack on Moscow. But it is, you know, something that you might see something like this in the New York Times or the Washington Post today. Obviously, they probably wouldn't label it this way. But the idea of combining multiple ideas into one in one design kind of theorem is kind of the point of Tufty and another of data visualization scholars. Another example is socio sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois, who around the turn of the century was known for his really colorful data visualizations. So we did a lot of research about the disparities between black and white Americans at the turn of the century. And just look at how kind of clean and focused these are. Like these are hand-drawn data visualizations. Like imagine how many drafts he went through with that spinny one. But it goes to show that good design principles are timeless. And in both of these examples, it's important to have that consistency. They all have the same fonts, the same colors. It all says the same thing. So you focus on the content, not the style. It's not distracting. It basically has a central thesis of how do I communicate with space to get someone to understand whatever it is I'm trying to communicate. So now that we've kind of established the kind of vintage data visualizations, we can move on to some of the more technical stuff. I'll kind of walk you through the variety of tools that you could use and that I use to create a variety of data visualizations. So the most common one, and the one that was the main tool until about recently is Adobe Illustrator. It's ideal for print because you can just draw on there like anything, like any other tool. So what I have here is a screenshot of the graph type. So if, I don't know if you're familiar with Adobe Illustrator, but on the left-hand bar, you have all your options. You click a button and it pops up this menu in which you can select the type of data visualization you wanna create. You, as you can see, you have bars, stack bars, columns, line, area chart, scatter plot, pie chart, and radar chart. Um, I don't think I've ever made a radar chart. That one's kind of funky. It's more of a kind of fancy design thing, but those are kind of the main building blocks of data visualization. Adobe Illustrator is great. It gives you almost too much freedom to which if you don't have a very defined visual style or like a style guide from, uh, I'm not certain, Laura, sorry about that. I just have my own screen. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it gives you those options. And uh, now that we've kind of moved away from primarily making data visualizations for print and posters and things like that, uh, the main focus tends to be on digital tools such as Flourish and Data Wrapper. We primarily use Data Wrapper at the Midwest Newsroom simply because it's easy to share. Sure, it's not the best thing, but it saves us the problem of having to constantly, hey, website, can you go and whitelist this URL so we can put this embed into whatever? And that's a pain, so we don't do that. Flourish is also really good, but Flourish is kind of like Adobe Illustrator in which it gives you a little bit too many options. So I really wouldn't recommend Flourish for someone who's just beginning, but if you have data that you wanna explore, if you have something that's kind of confusing, um, Flourish can be helpful to, to use. But again, I recommend going with Data Wrapper simply because it's kind of the, the main one in which the Midwest Newsroom uses and is uh, kind of has the same design uh, concepts that news in general does have. There's also Tableau, which you've probably encountered dealing with health or real estate data. It's kind of business focused. It's kind of meant for making those dashboards that CEOs really like. It's useful, but again, it gives you too many options and it can be kind of slow to load. So it's one of those things of if you get a big data set from a source, something like Tableau or Flourish can be helpful for you to figure out, okay, what does this mean? but it wouldn't necessarily publish anything with those tools. And then there are also the kind of real social scientist statistical things, such as the packages within R and within Python. Those are super useful. But again, I really won't over to, uh, I won't go into that as well because we're not in uh, the coding part of data journalism, but it's good to know that they also exist. So uh, kind of going deeper into data wrapper, some pros and cons. As I kind of mentioned before, Data Wrapper comes with this built-in design ethos. Their whole thing is they want to have data visualization that is explanatory. So we do a number of things uh, 
in data journalism that's exploratory. So asking questions of a data set, sorting, filtering, grouping, creating pivot tables, doing summary statistics, creating new ratios and population statistics. That's useful for writing, but not necessarily for visualization. Data Wrapper is better once you've already decided what you want to communicate within creating your, your data story. It's about showing that to your audience. So Data Wrapper was actually created by someone who used to work at the New York Times graphics team, Gregor Reich. And the nice thing about it is that, as I said before, it's really easy to share the embeds across different sites. And given that we're a network, we're a ton of stations and collaborations, it worked great for us. It also has that built-in responsivity. So if you're looking at a data wrapper chart on a tablet or a computer or a phone, it'll adjust that screen size. While if you created a static chart in Adobe Illustrator, that size is baked in. So if you're looking at something that has a small type on a phone or a tablet, it can be difficult to read. Data Wrapper solves this by adjusting the font size and all that based on the viewport of whatever screen you're looking at. The cons, there are some limited things you are not allowed to do in Data Wrapper, but that's, again, the design ethos of Data Wrapper. It kind of guides you in the more Tuftian style, the New York Times style. There's also the chance that it could shut down someday because companies rise and fall. So there's a possibility that a lot of my work just disappear as it has in the past, especially my early career stuff. And it's also German. So sometimes you put in a number and it reads the period as a comma because that's how they do it in the EU. Weirdos. It's got to be aware of that. And there are also some limitations with mapping just because mapping is complicated and expensive depending on how you do it. So Data Wrapper really limits you to a number of simple chloropleth. That's the one with the color in polygon one or some simple locator or point maps. So if you have a ton of points or a ton of polygons, Data Wrapper can't help you there. You need to use another free tool such as uh, doing yourself in Leaflet or within uh, Google Maps. So here's a little uh, look under the hood of what Data Wrapper has. So you notice there's a lot of columns and bars. The reason why that's the case is the human eye is basically a giant, we perceive things in a giant rectangle. That's why they're mostly bars, because that's the thing that our brain reads quickest, and we're able to compare the size of things. Because if you may have noticed, like with pie charts, for example, they're circular. If you have a pie chart that one has 25% and another pie chart has 33%, it's kind of difficult to see how close those twos are because those are weird kind of triangles. Our brain doesn't think in triangles, it thinks in squares. But if you saw two bars, one was like 100, 33, 25, our eyes would be able to guess quicker. Oh, that's about a quarter. That's about a third. So that's why there are so many bar chop options within Data Wrapper which depends on the kind of data you have. So the simplest is just the regular bar chart, just numbers of things. Then you have stack bars in which you have numbers of things, but there's two categories. So let's say you're comparing the rates of some health statistic between different populations. And the same thing goes with groups and splits. It's about the relationship between the different variables within the data. And then you also have the things that introduce temporality, such as lines and area charts. And you also have more comparisons, range, arrows, and dots. And scatter plots are useful if you have two variables that you want to compare within space X and Y. But when you're choosing a, cart, a chart, I recommend just use your journalism gut. Simplicity is best. It can be tempting to get really fancy with data visualization. But again, charts should explain, not confuse. Sure, not everything should be a bar, but more things should be a bar than you think. But it's important to have the other options as well. Like for instance, if you're comparing two values that aren't terribly different, I don't mind a pie or a donut, but if you had something that had like five or six variables, a pie or a donut really wouldn't make sense. It would be better to do area charts or stack bars or things like that. But when you are looking at some data and you're not certain what to visualize, that usually means you haven't spent enough time to fully understand your data. Because once you understand the universe, what you're working with, this should somewhat be intuitive. So if you get to the point of, hey, I don't know how to design this, I'm confused, that's a sign you need to spend more time with your data or ask a source about how we need to understand this in a little bit uh, different way. So visual design is about choices. So I brought this famous example of a strange choice. Um, this is literally a chart that USA Today put together uh, in 2011, which shows uh, this heat index 
I don't know why they chose to go with that joke, but they did. Um, my thought is if you're going to go this far, you might as well have gone with the head sunstroke, but whatever. Um, again, it's about choices. This is obviously a bad choice, but the choices we do need to consider when we're designing anything is how much information do we need to put in there? Do we have lots of annotation or just a little bit? Do we want this to be something that people spend some time clicking around with or can just scroll past and get that main idea? These rules can be broken, but they should be broken for a good reason. So you need to kind of take your conceptualization of whatever data you have and then put it through. What is the main point I want to get across? And that driving thesis will help you determine what makes the most sense. Um, hold on. And also, it's important to consider accessibility. So for instance, um, there's a bit of a movement against putting too much in what are called tooltips. So that's when you interact with a chart and you see some kind of number or some kind of stat that pops up. Because on phones, it's kind of difficult to use and be kind of clunky. And especially people who are visually impaired, that's even more difficult to do. So that's why like when I have a lot of information that has, you know, tooltips or information within a map, it's better to kind of show that in the more obvious place to which it shows at first, rather than burying it. Because there are some people who believe you shouldn't put anything in a tooltip at all because people won't look at it. But again, you need to consider your audience. It's important to think about how we make things that are accessible. And that includes people who are visually impaired, people who are colorblind, all of those things are something that you should consider. And Data Wrapper does help you kind of avoid some of those mistakes. It has a little warning if your colors are too close and things like that. But it's always important to consider, especially given that we're public media, everyone should be able to consume our content. So therefore, all of our stuff should be accessible. So uh, we'll now move on to the next portion, which is basically a walkthrough of design choices. So kind of what I discussed earlier with the different choices we have to make with our data and our understanding of visual design, but breaking it down piece by piece for something we actually published. So uh, this is the chart from our Vinebrook investigation that we published last spring. So this is kind of the summary statistics of all of the information that we gathered for this story. So its base is census data, which is both the percent of white people living in a given census tract and the median household income in the census tract. So that's the two X and Y axes. And then the colors of the dots are the number of properties that this company purchased in that specific census tract. So when you put these two variables together, you can see the relationship between the two of them, in which in general, Vinebrook tends to purchase homes that are generally non-white and generally not lower income, but low-ish income in the 40 to 55 income range, which makes sense because this company wants to purchase homes that are geared towards renters who make a little bit of money, enough money to be able to purchase a single family home and, and rent a single family home, but not be, you know, buying the homes that are extremely desirable or incredibly large. So by combining all that information, we can put that together in one kind of general idea. And this does communicate, oh, this is what this company wants to purchase. It wants to purchase homes that are nice enough, but not the nice dish. So uh, moving on to the data. So this data was hand generated uh, from a spreadsheet that we created while we were reporting. So I exported that stuff from the US Census. I joined it with another data set and then using some spatial tools was able to count the number of properties in each census tract to generate those three variables. And I of course had to clean and standardize this information from these various sources. The census is relatively easy, just kind of clunky and large and they use files that are kind of annoying, but relatively easy to work with. It was dealing with the nine different counties. That was the pain because of course, every county has to do something different. And of course, one county wanted to charge me and all that fun stuff, but I was able to standardize it. So it was just simple, simple spreadsheet with those main variables. And it's also important to mention that most real world data is messy. You have agencies that don't know how to do it correctly. They put it in weird formats. They maybe hand wrote it. It could be in a PDF. There's usually some cleaning that always happens. So to discuss the structure, the rows, like I said before, the census tract, the count of homes, income, percent white, and I also had the market so I could do that color coding as well. And then the columns were each record, and there were 287 of them. So uh, this is kind of an aside, but something important to mention. 
Size is something that you usually don't have to worry about when you're creating things within Data Wrapper, but if you're using a different tool, it's important to consider. So if I was doing a static print version of the thing you saw, I couldn't create that until the designer had given me the size of the artboard because the width and length and height of it determines how much space I have for the text. So rather than thinking about it in this way, it's also important to consider how does it look on your phone, which generally is 640 pixels or smaller. It's important to kind of come at DataViz from the idea of mobile first, because we know that's when people read our stuff. So if it doesn't work on mobile, it doesn't work anywhere. You've got to make sure it works there on first. So in general, if you have too much data or it's too confusing, try to pare it down. And remember, size is important, phone first. And if you're running into size problems, that's kind of a sign you're trying to do too much. Maybe this is multiple charts. Maybe this is something that needs to be text instead. But remember, size is still very important. So uh, moving on, here's what it looks like inside Data Wrapper of how I did the styling of that chart we saw earlier. So we edited the axes by having the horizontal be income, the vertical being percent white. We used custom formatting for the labels to add the dollar sign. And SDLPR gave me custom colors to make it look good on their site, which was great. And then I added opacity. So if we had two things that were um, overlapping, you could see both of them rather than the bigger one overlapping the other. And I also added the variable size. So the bigger circles indicated more properties and the smaller circles indicated smaller ones. So in a way, this is a very informationally dense graphic in which we have all of those variables all working together to communicate a point. And it's very much a game of how do I adjust all of these variables to get the main point I want to cross without being too confusing. Because if I took apart one part of this, if they were all the same color, if they're all the same size, you may not get the main idea I'm trying to get across. It's using all of those things in tandem to communicate the point that I'm trying to make visually. So even if you're just scrolling by the story at a glance, you get this main idea that there's this clustering of properties that fall in these criteria, which is the income and also the diversity of the census tract. So to put it in kind of radio language, styling is just like choosing an audio cut, focusing on what you want the audience to know and what communicates it in the most direct and focused way. And sometimes figuring this out just means asking. Um, when I was at the San Diego Union Tribune, I found it really helpful to go to people who didn't have any design knowledge and I would just ask, hey, does this make sense to you? And if they were confused, that's a sign that I needed to do more work to communicate this better. And the same thing goes with, you know, pretty much any journalism tool. Sometimes it's it's best to ask someone who doesn't know anything about what you're doing. And if they're confused, you need to do more work to make sure we're communicating the thing clearly to our audiences. So uh, here's an example of something I did back in the day, which was um, the indictment of former representative Duncan Hunter. Basically, it was the guy who thought that he had more money and decided to use his campaign credit card for, uh, as you can see, almost everything. So he misspent a total of... Uh, $250,000, a good quarter million dollars on everything you see here. But uh, this is where I turn it over to you. Um, what are the, some of the design choices that I made in creating this? If anyone, feel free to unmute and uh, say them. Um, There's no color. Why do you think? I, why do I think there's no color or why do I think there should be color? <laughs> There's no color because this is the one that ran in the inside page, which didn't have oh color. Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah. But I did use different grays to communicate the difference, which is what you have to do in that scenario. Anybody else? Yep, grouping. Yeah, so this is what's called a tree map, which is basically how a pie chart should be, basically. This is basically a giant square pie chart to which you see the subsections of each thing in which it all adds to the whole. So this is a good example of, of, an, of a chart in which both the part of the chart, so the individual spending, the tuition, the airfare and vacations is equally as important as the entire group. So this both balances what the top level thing is and what the minutia is. So when I made this version, I also made a version in Tableau, which you could hover and see the specific line item of the indictment and what the, they spent on it. And my favorite one was um, he, uh, Duncan Hunter went to a bachelor party and bought, I think it was 67 shots of tequila in one steak. Um, 
why not? Uh, but yeah, it, it was a way to, to get all that information all together. But again, the design choices that I mainly made here was how do we communicate just the sheer not caring about the rules here? And I do think when you break it down using space and using the categories, you could see the sheer level of not caring about the rules that this former congressman had. And one thing that's also notable is that this was not a clean data set. This was literally a FBI report in which sometimes they had exact totals, sometimes they had something rounded, and they had to convert all of that text into actual data. So me and my coworkers, Christina Bivek and Michelle Gilchrist, went through each thing line by line and created our own spreadsheet of thing that, that they spent on and the total, and that's how we created that. And that's also why you have this huge methodology of us explaining what we did, because obviously it's not something that the hunters were excited to see printed in the newspaper, but when you have to, you know, get your hands dirty data wise, you need to kind of explain the decisions that you made, which is why it's the most long methodology you've probably seen in a long time. All right. Any other thoughts before we move on to the next section? Take that as a no. Cool. Uh, so this is the fun part. Why is this chart bad? What do you think? Yep. Uh, hex maps are useful when you want to kind of obscure the geography. So like NPR, their, their main desk sometimes does a lot of hex maps for like different state laws and stuff. But obviously, if you don't have the labeling of the states, it's not doesn't mean anything at all because you can't abstract um, some data. but You can't do it all the way. And again, yeah, just someone wasn't thinking, probably was rushed, made that mistake. Um, it's also. Uh, again, I'm not certain if this needed to be a map. Maybe it could have just been a list, like it might be easier to understand that way. Um, it can be difficult to break out of the map brain sometimes because sometimes you learn a new tool and it's kind of the hammer and nail problem in which everything is the thing you just learned. So this is an example of probably someone who had just started uh, using Flourish, got a little bit excited and uh, didn't fully think it through. Here's another fun example. Um, thing that probably shouldn't be a chart. Uh, one of the nuts thing about this one is that you look at it and you get further confused. Like what, Finland only has one happiness? Like what? Yeah, it's like rankings really aren't numbers. They shouldn't be visualized that way. Um, just a classic thing that should have been communicated in a very different way. And uh, here's another good example. Um, this is a map of popular EDM songs from Pandora kind of a mess, very blue. Um, this is another example of maybe this shouldn't have been a map or maybe find a way to categorize them differently. Chloropleth maps are useful when you're showing, you know, a range of things. So like number of cows per state, have that in categories that communicates that effectively. But when you have this many different things, it's just not useful to communicate because this image is not communicating anything at all. And this is probably the example of, you know, someone's boss saying, hey, I want this and not explaining it. And the person was just like, okay, boss, here you go. And not very useful. But again, these are just simple mistakes that can easily be corrected by just thinking it through, pausing, asking the question, does this make sense? And if the answer is no, it's a sign that something went wrong in the process. And I always view data visualization as a conversation because you need to have multiple brains think about a thing. Otherwise, you can make a simple mistake and you don't want to have to run a correction because you didn't do your due diligence in the first place. All right, so that's the main section of everything. I'll uh, have some suggestions for books to learn more about this subject. Um, the Wall Street Journal Guide to Information Graphics is really good for the kind of tufty in how do we just communicate things effectively. Um, the book is a little bit dated. It's kind of built in the kind of uh, Adobe Illustrator age, but it's still important to kind of have those basics. 
Um, the, the visual display of quantitative inform information was the one I mentioned earlier, which is also a great read and is more meta and conceptual. And a more modern one is How to Lie with Charts by Alberto Cairo, a nice uh, read on how to um, both spot sketchy statistics and create them for yourselves. And um, Data Wrapper actually has a data image dispatch every Tuesday. It's a blog post where they collect infographics across the world and have some commentary on it. I sometimes get ideas from that, and it's just a, a kind of fun roundup of visual news around uh, this subject. All right. That's everything that I have. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. We won't have questions until we need you <laughs> to do something specific. Usually how it goes. If, if you don't know, uh, Daniel does do office hours twice a month, but you don't have to wait for those. Um, uh, so if you get a bunch of data, like some, and something that's very messy and you really don't know where to, to start, should this be a hex map? Should this be a chart? You just, you know, save yourself a headache and talk to Daniel early and often. Um, and, um, you know, I think that a data state of mind is a, is a really important thing when you're trying to show people in a very um, clear way, a trend or a thing. And I wonder, Daniel, if you can talk a little bit about like what would be a good mental checklist for someone who's working on a story, it has numbers, what 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 is what are the questions they should be asking about whether this, this needs a data visualization aspect? So if you have more than, this is kind of arbitrary, but more than like three or four numbers that are important within your net graph, that's a sign that maybe it should be visualized. Because on the opposite end of, if I don't have enough, there's nothing I can really make. So, you know, if you only have two, three points, that's not really useful. But if you need to compare something or if you need to really draw attention to something, like let's say, you know, an event or a disease or something is just way higher than something else, that's worth visualizing. Because we know that readers take data visualizations a bit more seriously than text. Um, it is just a, a more, um, has more ethos, I guess, to use the rhetoric term. So we should use that when needed. So like when we have something that needs to have extra emphasis, that's when it's worth having. But again, I need to have enough stuff to actually create it. So that's the kind of minimum viable data is. But if it's a case of like, okay, one shocking statistic, maybe that's just a pull quote or something. What other questions you all have? You must have some questions. I'm going to show you a recent story that has some very simple things that I always want a map. So I'm that person who always wants a map. So Daniel is like, that ah, doesn't need to be a map. So I'm going to show you something that we did recently that was extremely elegant. And um, let's see, yes, and clear. So this is a story about uh, tobacco products. Um, whenever I get um, a press release or a pitch that has to do with the region, I ask myself, um, is there data in this that could be useful for um, our partners? And so I found some data that was sort of like, in a, it was like grades, they gave us grades. But the way that it was presented was in on separate web pages on a site from the Lung Association. So what I did was I provided Daniel with the information and he was able to combine that and give us something really clear. Um, here it is, here's the four states, here's how they're doing, here's what those things mean. And then again, this is data wrapper, so it's perfectly easy to embed and, um, and give, a, and, and then looks fine on mobile. And then the other one we put in here is smoking rates. And again, clean and simple. Um, I'm always thinking about how to show trends over time. To me, sometimes when you're giving data, if you're doing a story and you're, you tell people that 90% of people in Missouri are smokers in the year 2024, well, what does that mean? How, how many were there last year? How many were there five years ago? So to me, that's another clue that I need to talk to Daniel about 
showing something over time. And um, so we were able to go back to 2015. And uh, I like a good five year span at minimum to show a trend. Um, but sometimes, um, you know, agencies don't have that or they have it for one state, but not the other. For us, we often find, oh, Kansas doesn't give that information. Or, um, and the reason I put Illinois in this one was because St. Louis being close to, uh, St. Louis also serves Illinois. And so when I can, I think about that. Um, but those, this is just a simple story. This was a spot on the radio, but then we can also deliver more to the, the, uh, the consumer, the audience, if they want it. Um, and I thought three, three graphics would be too much for this. So I just did a little bullet point thing down here for the other, um, for the other, uh, issue that I wanted to point out, which was high school tobacco use. So yeah, that's, um, does anybody have any questions about this kind of thing? It's always just asking yourself, there's numbers in this. Should I be thinking about data visualization? That's a key question to ask yourself in my book. I was there, that. Was there other reporting, Holly, that went into that? Or, yeah, I mean so... As you can see, I interviewed um, I interviewed uh, Yolanda Richardson. I interviewed uh, who was it that I interviewed? Was, uh, I she's the person from the campaign for tobacco free Amer uh, kids. And then I also interviewed who's the other person? Yeah, so I did a couple of interviews. Um, I used the data um, and I um, linked to the uh, study. And, and sometimes, we, oh, here it is, Harold Wimmer. One of the things I love is that a lot of agencies will give you things on an embargo basis. If you get a package of information and data on an embargo basis, you've got a spot for Thursday that you can have data a data visualization if you give it to Daniel as soon as you get that, that embargo data. And then you have a story ready to go right when the embargo lifts for digital. And you can have it scheduled to run you know, at 4 a.m. or whatever time your, um, your station um, does uh you know publishes stuff in the morning let me see if i can find another good example of this um have... while you are i have a question go for it okay so i know that um we're talking about these data visualizations being just really good tools um for obviously pulling in our readers and presenting it in a different way i'm wondering if data wrapper has an like options on sharing on social media, these um, infographics and graphs and I mean, data viz like on their own while also linking to the story. No, they don't. Um, they're kind of more focused on providing a service inside of CMS than sharing it on social, but it's possible to create templates like on Canva or Adobe Illustrator in which you can convert um, your charts and maps into something for uh, social media. The only thing I would be wary of is sometimes the margins can get kind of funky, especially on Instagram. So give yourself more white space than you would normally if you are going down that route. Thank you. This is a fairly um, interesting one where we, we did have a number of visualizations because there was a lot Oops, the photo is not showing up. There was a lot going on um, with this story that we wanted people to understand the numbers in a way that made sense. So we did, um, and this first air, this was first on St. Louis Public Radio, so it looks different on their site. But um, so we talked about, we showed again over time, students found out living outside the district. This story was about these aggressive tactics that the school district uses to, to uh, weed out people who it thinks is try, are trying to steal their, their education. So we wanted to show how aggressively they've been investigating. And as you can see, the number of investigations has leapt. And this was, I think uh, it was, yeah, this is a good, nice five year period. And the number of people that they found doing that wrongdoing has not really increase that much relative to the investigations. So that was one way to show that. Same, that so you're telling a story, right, with that um, 
vis visualization. And then oh, those are the two wonderful people from the school district. Then um, you got, we had this other thing down here, I think too. Uh, yeah, so this one is like, well, again, you, when you're trying to compare to other um, to other things, like you can say, well, Hazelwood has all these investigations and all these homeless children. So, okay, so what about other places? Like, so that's another great thing that you could show. And this could, I, I mean, again, I think I probably asked for a map for this, but when you're talking about, um, these are very close together cities in a very uh, succinct part of, North County, and it could get a little bit confusing to try to put these numbers in a map and have people hover over the the little town or the little school district to f find the numbers. So Daniel said, "Let's." Nobody knows the thing. shape of a school district; it's meaningless to people. Yeah, and 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 so it's not like these are the boundaries of St. Louis, and here's what we're talking about. These it would makes a lot more sense to give it to people in this way, and um, again, you can compare apples to apples or apples to oranges, if you will, to show, compare, you know. So here's Hazelwood doing all these investigations and it has hardly any homeless unhoused students in the district compared to Ferguson Florissant, which hardly does any investigations. So again, you want to show the story that you're telling. And then we also saw that it seemed like as Hazelwood got blacker, they were doing more investigations. So we also can show that. Right. And so that's why we did a number of um, a number of data visualizations for this one, because there was a lot of information and um, we wanted to there's no way we're going to get those numbers onto radio, as you know. So it made sense to to break them out in that way. And so I thought that was a, a good example as well of, of information in that in that space. But again, when you're trying to show something over time trying to compare apples to apples or apples to oranges, as you will, as it will, um, trying to show trends, trying to compare one thing to another. These are some very simple things that I think about when I'm deciding whether I need to talk to Daniel. And, and with our with our projects, we we all talk from the start and Daniel is always in the in the in the Zoom room with all the rest of us as we talk about a project and whether I mean, almost, I mean, nine out of 10 things will have data, but what is the data? You know, how, how messy is it? How hard is it to get? Um, what do we do with it when we get it? Um, so these are all things that we can work through with you as well. If you have, even again, like a story that you know you're gonna do for a spot on Thursday, you have some information on Monday or Tuesday, you know, we can help you to put together something, or when I say we, I mean Daniel, uh, something fairly um, helpful and simple that can really bring your story, make, you know, make your story look different. Harvest uses uh, Daniel services quite a bit. What's a recent harvest one, um, Daniel, that you worked on? Uh, I did a map for the U.S. Forest Service story. That was kind of maybe in December was the most recent one. Okay. Yeah, we've got a few things coming up. Um, one that I think is going to be challenging is we're doing a story on PFAS and lack of testing. Um, in Midwestern states where the story is basically focused on biosolids, taking sewer stuff and fertilizing land. And in Michigan, they had a, a farm that was shut down because the biosolids contained a lot of PFAS and it contaminated the land. Anyway, Michigan tests their sewer treatment plants. Most of our other states don't. So we are right now, our reporters are going to individual states and asking them a set of questions. I've shared that Google Doc with Daniel. Um, we're getting close to getting all the data and then what we're gonna do with that? <laughs> I don't really know exactly. Like I, I also love a map because I just find it so easy to be like, oh yeah, okay, now I know where I am and I know what state, but um, I know Daniel is not thinking of maybe a map for that one. Yeah, because like for the map, the geography itself has to matter. The reason why this is the map, because this is literally the polygons of forests. And the reason why it's in Google My Maps and not Data Wrapper is that Data Wrapper limits you to 100 discrete features. And there are more than 100 discrete features here. And it also has to be under two megabytes of GeoJSON, which I think this is about 10 megabytes of GeoJSON, which is uh, JavaScript uh, notation for 
any spatial data. So what are, what's the story that this map is is telling us, Daniel? Uh, how old the forests are. So like basically the U.S. government kind of uses forests as investments. So when they get, I think it's older, they're more likely to chop them down when actually it's important to have a mix of old and young forests for reasons, right? <laughs> so how do we know? And so, yeah, it's all about one, urban capture. Reasons. How do we know what color represents what here? Do we just, we do, we, do the colors click on, mean anything? Hit to click on one. Okay, so let's click on this one and see what we get. How cool is that? Yeah, think, it just reveals all this information to you. So you have, you have uh, this kind of yeah, little yeah. hidden thing of information, old growth, mature, yeah. Yeah, Google isn't the prettiest, but it gets the work done. Yeah. It's, it's kind of what we're stuck with, given that we don't have millions of dollars. Yes, we don't. We don't. So that's another yep. really different thing. But again, like 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 Daniel said, when geography matters, a map is helpful. When geography is just maybe an incidental thing, you know, or it's a crutch maybe that you would think of to use because you think it would be pretty. Um, it's really th think think about like is is where something is on a map important to the story? Are we just clicking on something to show a statistic? that happens to exist in Iowa, but we can easily do that in a chart or some other kind of way. So I think that's that's another way that I, um, I'm trying to think um, differently. Um, I also learned some very basic Google tool, Google Maps tools. Um, and it's like Daniel said, I wanted to use it for everything. When I was working in TV news, everything I did had a Google map in it. Um, and it was very cool because it was fun to do. You customize it and it, there's some very cool things you can do, but again, is it is it what you actually um, need to do? So, yeah. What else? We still have some time. No question is too small or random. Nothing. Daniel, what do you think about third party um, uh, tools? And are how concerned are you that Data Wrapper will go the way of Storify and leave a bunch of stories with broken links and uh, missing information? I would say slightly concerned. Um, part of it is uh, you're still sharing your screen, Holly. Um, part of the issue is technically at the Midwest Newsroom we don't have a digital infrastructure. Like if we were one thing, or if NPR was more better with connecting i'd be more okay with creating kind of a tool that like brent had with um with daily graphics but because we don't have that and i'm in the station that doesn't have any digital infrastructure that's useful um, means that i'm kind of stuck with data wrapper for now i mean theoretically yeah i could create everything static which is fine but again it becomes in that responsivity problem so it's kind of like in each thing you Nothing's perfect. So it's like pick your poison. And I'm sticking with the the, the um, data wrapper poison for now. But, you know, if it comes down to it, maybe it's time to start doing some more illustrator things. Are there any terms or things that, that, that were mentioned, that Daniel mentioned that you didn't understand or would like more explanation on? I think you were pretty clear in speaking non non data journalist language but i know that there might be some people that have questions about that anything there okay hey i have one question for you daniel and this is um on topic but a little different is what is the landscape look like with ai generated data visualization right now and is what's the conversation like that in in your world so I'm not seeing a ton of that at the moment because every place has their own design philosophy, but I feel like you break the rules consistently enough to which it's difficult to train an AI to do that effectively. Um, I do think it could be useful to create like extremely simple things like, you know, the LA Times had the quick plot, like way back in like 2009, things like that. And, you know, if it's a small thing, I think it's fine. But if it's anything that requires nuanced decision-making, that's where it's better to have a person do it. 
but also are we going to have the weird problems of like, you know, the extra fingers in a chart, maybe a bar says seven, but it's really six and things like that. And that's where it's dangerous of, you don't want to create errors, but at least in the communities that I'm in, I'm not seeing a ton of um, discussion about AI, just mostly using it to speed up writing some code and things like that. There's still the, we still have to do the journalism, which keeps, you know, the idea of AI as just a magic button kind of a bay. Yeah, Daniel, I was wondering about the, not as it, you tell, not that it would be making the journalism decisions, but be made that how far away the gener like generative AI might be with using it to do the coding for you. You say what you want and then it, and it does that for you, but still making the journalism decisions. Yeah, I feel like that's already happening. But um, again, it's like you almost, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem of like, you kind of have to tell it, write a Python script that uses these libraries, which transforms this data in this way, to which if you don't know any Python, how are you even going to ask that question? So I kind of see it more as, someone who's already, you know, moderately to advanced skilled using it to as a check or as a maybe a way to make things faster, but I don't really see it as like a beginner entry level person being able to use it yet. Mm -hmm. I want to show one more thing before we we go and I'll ask Daniel to cast his mind back to see if he remembers this project. Um, this is one of our first projects that we did. And it was with the California newsroom. They had a bunch of data. And it was also our first illustration, which was lovely. Um, it was uh, about the smoke that's coming over, right? And so we did these maps. So this is showing you, again, color and, and a location. Because it's important. This is an important example of the map matters because we're talking about places. Can you just talk a little bit about what we're seeing here, um, Daniel, in this map? Yeah, so Stanford used satellite imagery and they basically tracked the number of smoky days in a given place um, from 2016 to 2020. I believe they used a combination of um, raster math to figure out um, the number of smoky days. Um, the data was presented in a number of ways and I chose to go with the percent change from, I think it was, can you scroll up to a little bit, yeah. Um, the percent change from like 2016, 2020. Um, and it did kind of reveal this trend in general. For some reason, the zip codes were used, which zip codes aren't geography. What you're actually seeing is a zip code tabulation area, which is a zicta. But as you can see, some of these are really funny shaped um, and not very useful. But, but because we're showing um, data that's spatial in nature and has a general trend, it does work. But imagine if this was like, a ton, like a ton of different colors, like a mosaic, like that wouldn't really communicate much. But because it does kind of have this smoke, you know, it, it's 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 smoke, it's air. It has this kind of general trend. That's why I went with um, showing it this way. And we did it for the other states as well. Um, I think it was Iowa was the weird one in which it actually got better. A little bit of Kansas as well. But um, it was kind of challenging. Um, to visualize just because the way the data was structured. And, and again, we have the problem of, okay, four states, different geographies. And also the range was both extremely positive and negative at the same time. So I needed to have a, a color scale that communicated both of those two things, but didn't look super gross. Um, there's this color scheme that some geographers use called viridis, which is extremely, it's like this neon purple and neon um, yellow, which is useful for showing like outliers, but is ugly as heck. So I don't really use that. All right. Yeah. So again, you know, thinking about, um, you know, give yourself like, I know as reporters, everybody has like their own checklist of what they need for a story. But if you ask yourself, okay, there's some things here, I can show a comparison or show a trend or show something that happening in a place. Those are maybe three ways that you could think about having a data state of mind when you are um, considering a story, especially if it's a story that you are putting a lot of um, time into and it's a feature for the radio. Um, you can make it a really um, 
rich multimedia experience for the audience because once the radio is done, it's done, but your audio and your words live on on that page. And if people can have a unique experience on your story page, it's going to have more time. They're going to spend more time on the site than on the page. They're going to click on things. They're going to look at things like photos. Um, you'll see our, our, our stuff that we do in the Midwest newsroom always includes, um, we try to always include people's faces, but also um, some kind of data visualization. And that's going to give people a really like, sort of multidimensional um, experience with your story. So um, that's, that's, that's what I love about digital because you can do, all of the cool things, but um, boy, this was before you even started, Chris. <laughs> I'm just remembering, and and we were we were three <laughs> three people in the Midwest newsroom. Ah, oh, those are the days um, of the early uh, struggles. Anyway, um, I'm going to stop sharing. Great. Um, well, if there's no other questions, um, Daniel, um, thank you so much. Um, we'll share out this deck and the recording. Um, and so that folks who did not uh, get to uh, join us or would like to relive it can do so. And again, just remember um, to be looking. I, I usually post these um, in our Midwest Newsroom Slack, the KCUR Slack, the STLPR Slack. Um, Chris shares it in Iowa. Daniel shares it in Nebraska. So anytime he has office hours, you will know. And if you have a question, just ask. Um, and also, um, again, you don't have to wait for those if you do have a story. Um, next office hours are, are Tuesday. There, Daniel has a, a Zoom room. Um, the link is always in our Midwest Newsroom general Slack. If you're not, and if you have no access to that, just Daniel's in all of the Missouri Slacks too. So he, he you can find him in the case you are as well as uh, St. Louis Slack uh, if you have a question. So. Great, thank you, Gregory. Um, say hi to everybody in Springfield. I don't know if you saw my my awesome epic um, uh, poll about whether uh, Missouri is in the South, but a lot of people weighed in about Springfield. <laughs> I'm kind of obsessed with it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> thanks everybody, and um, we'll see you next time. <laughs>